Hello, everyone, and welcome to week seven of USMLE Domination High Yield Tutorial. Uh, we have a great, great uh, tutorial here today. But before I begin, please subscribe to the channel. Please share this with all your friends and colleagues. Let this free knowledge go viral so that everyone can benefit and ace the USMLE exam. So let's go ahead and get started. We're going to start with a high yield question as always. So which of the following conditions is this infant also at risk for? So we have a chest x-ray of a person of a newborn infant. And is, is the condition in this infant also at risk for tuberous sclerosis, intraventricular hemorrhage, aortic stenosis, or cystic fibrosis? What would be the right answer here? And I'll, we're going to come back to this question at the very end of the lecture. So I promise that we'll do that. So we're going to go ahead and get started with neonatal lung disease. This is a super high yield topic that I'm sure you guys will get on either the step one or the step two exam, maybe even the step three. And the four most important topics for neonatal lung disease when a baby is born is surfactant deficiency disease or respiratory distress syndrome or highland membrane disease, transient tachypnea of the newborn, neonatal pneumonia, and meconium aspiration syndrome. And starting with, uh, let's actually start with a newborn chest. So this is what a, new, a, a normal chest x-ray would look like in a newborn. Uh, notice that there's you know, nice aeration of the lungs, the volumes are good. Typically, if you can count nine to 11 ribs, in this case, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, we have about eight and a half ribs, almost nine ribs, nine ribs on the left. Uh, you know, people make a big deal about, you know, lung volume. It's, you know, in, in practicality, it's not super helpful, but you know, this is, this would be normal. This is a normal cardiothymic silhouette. It can appear prominent because you have the thymus here as well. So this is not cardiomegaly. This is just a, a prominent, a, a normal cardiothymic silhouette. But importantly, there's no pleural effusions. There's no blunting of the cost of angles on the right or the left to suggest pleural fluid. There's no pneumothorax. There's no focal opacity to suggest pneumonia. This is just normal vascularity that's branching out to the lung parenchyma. Um, notice there's no pneumoperitoneum or free air under the diaphragm. Uh, there's no rib fractures here. The vertebral bodies look normal. This is what a normal chest x-ray would look like. Contrast that to surfactant deficiency disease or respiratory dis distress syndrome uh, where there are focal abnormalities. So this, it's important to understand the physiology too. So surfactant is produced by type two pneumocytes. And what that, what that does is that it decreases the alveolar surface tension, it decreases alveolar collapse, and it increases compliance to the lung. And this is, it's your body, the newborn baby is making or synthesizing surfactant between 20 and 35 weeks gestation. And so this, when you have respiratory distress syndrome, when you have decreased surfactant, it's really a disease of premature infants. And that's the key, right? Prematurity is a major risk factor for, you know, RDS or respiratory distress syndrome. And other risk factors may include diabetes, but you know the, the key risk factor that they're likely to tell you on the USMLE is a premature uh, a baby or a preemie. Um, and we typically, you know, if if someone has if, if it's known that someone's going to have RDS, we give the mother steroids because steroids helps with the synthesis of surfactant, and, and a child will give them exogenous surfactant after they're born to help stimulate the you know surfactant. And what you're looking for here, typically, you're going to see low lung volumes. In this case, you know it. Again, lung volume is not super helpful. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, about almost nine ribs, which is pretty much normal, right? But you know, in the in the literature and the textbooks, you're gonna read low lung volumes, but the key is these diffuse granular opacities. Notice that the lung parenchyma looks very hazy. That's the key in the diagnosis for respiratory distress syndrome or surfactant deficiency disease. That's the key finding. You're looking for a diffuse reticular granular opacities within the lungs. Let's move on to transient tachypnea of the newborn. This is a disease of retained fetal fluid, okay? These are typically term infants, not premature infants like RDS, but term infants, okay? And the key risk factor here is they're gonna be born via C-section. That will definitely be in the stem on the USMLE. If you don't see C-section in the clinical vignette, it, the answer is not gonna be TTN. Okay, that's a key risk factor because what happens is, is in a vaginal delivery, the chest is compressed, causing fluid to be expelled during a vaginal delivery. When you don't have that mechanism, you retain this fetal fluid. And that's what causes transient tachypnea of the newborn. Um, again, usually in full-term infants, uh, this is going to resolve in two or three days. That's the key too. This is very, it just, it just occurs for one or two days. By two or three days, the lung is going to look normal. But typically what you're seeing on the on a chest x-ray is it's going to look like pulmonary edema, interstitial edema. You have these uh, interstitial opacities, you know, very subtle interstitial opacities kind of stemming from the hyla 
into the lung parenchyma here, okay? Looks very much like interstitial edema. You're gonna have normal to maybe increase lung volumes. Pretty much the volumes are gonna be normal, but you're really just looking for these interstitial opacities that, sim that looks very similar to pulmonary edema. That's transient tachypnea of the newborn. Moving on to needle in, neonatal pneumonia. This is most commonly caused by group, group B strep, and it can be acquired via the transplacental route or aspiration of infected amniotic fluid. And this typically presents in the first two days of life. It, it can present up to the first month of life, but really in the first two days of life is when most, you know, preemie, uh, most uh, babies get neonatal pneumonia. And this also occurs mainly in preemies, um, and it looks very similar to RDS, very similar, same patient population, you know, premature infants, sometimes term, but mainly premature infants. Um, and the chest radiographic findings look very similar. They, you know, there's these, you know, diffuse granular reticular opacities, and sometimes it can be indistinguishable on a chest x-ray from RDS. The one key finding that occurs in two thirds of patients that's seen here is the presence of a pleural effusion. Notice that there's blunting of the costophrenic angle here. That's a key, that's probably the only radiographic feature that can distinguish neonatal pneumonia from RDS or respiratory distress syndrome. Otherwise, it's essentially indistinguishable. The other thing is the clinical picture is going to be a little different. These patients are going to, um, these, these patients are going to present with maybe a fever, maybe tachypnea, cough, grunting, sepsis, leukocytosis, positive cultures. That's, you know, most of those things are not going to be seen in RDS. Um, the other thing is, is that we typically screen moms at 35 to 37 weeks of gestation for group B strep. And we, you know, during labor, we give them intrapartum prophylaxis with penicillin, but often these patients, you know, are preemies and they don't, the, ba the, the mothers don't get screened. So that's why we have neonatal pneumonia. Okay. So very similar to RDS, but look for that pleural effusion that can potentially be a distinguishing feature for neonatal pneumonia. And finally, with meconium aspiration syndrome, this occurs after meconium stained amniotic fluid is aspirated. And what happens is, is that you get obstruction of small airways that leads to air trapping, and then you get a chemical pneumonitis that affects the airways and the lung parenchyma. This is a disease of term or post-term neonates. That's the key here. Term, and particularly post-term, when you start to see someone that's, you know, 42 or 43 weeks, remember the normal, normal term of delivery is 37 to 42 weeks. If you see someone 41, 42, 43 weeks, maybe start thinking about meconium aspiration syndrome. Okay, they typically present with respiratory distress with cyanosis, nasal flaring, tachypnea, grunting. Uh, but the key radiographic features are going to be a little different than what we've seen before. We have coarse, linear, rope like opacities emanating from the hyla or the peribronchial regions. Notice that these opacities look a little bit more coarse. Um, they're more well defined. They're not like the hazy granular opacities, and they kind of almost have a rope like appearance emanating from the hyla or from the peribronchial spaces. And typically, the, the appearance of the lung can appear hyperinflated. So, you know, it's been described to have increased lung volumes. And here you can see, you know, maybe nine and a half to 10 ribs here um, in terms of the, the inspiratory effort here. So that's what meconium aspiration syndrome would look like. Now the must know US assembly points here, um, it's, a, it's a complex topic. So that's why I had, there's a lot in here in RDS, you're looking for a premature infant, okay? It's, it's obviously due to decreased surfac surfactant produced by type two pneumocytes. You're looking for low lung volumes and diffuse granular opacities on a chest x-ray. And the pearls here is it, because they're preemies, they're, there's a high association with intraventricular hemorrhage and necrotizing enterocolitis. That's an important feature for the USMLE. Patients with RDS have a higher association of developing intraventricular hemorrhage and necrotizing enterocolitis because they're premature infants. You want to make sure you give the mom steroids and the child gets exogenous surfactant. Transient tachypnea of the newborn is a self-limiting condition always look for that C-section history. That's a key historical finding in the vignette that'll lead you to TTN in term infants. You're looking for just an interstitial edema pattern on chest x-ray. It's gonna resolve in two to three days, definitely by three days. Neonatal pneumonia, uh, you're looking for cough, grunting, sepsis, usually gonna present presented the first two days of life. Imaging very similar to RDS, almost indistinguishable, but you want to look for that pleural effusion that's seen in two thirds of patients that can help differentiate this from RDS. And we always want to screen the mom at 35 to 37 weeks for, with group B strep, which is the most common causative organism causing neonatal pneumonia. And finally, meconium aspiration syndrome, you're looking for that post-term infant history. That's very important. You're looking for coarse rope-like perihilar opacities with hyperinflation. And you want to look for that history of meconium stain amniotic fluid. Those are the four most common 
neonatal, neonatal lung disease you're going to see on the USMLE. Let's come back to this high yield question. Which of the following conditions is this infant also at risk for? This is a chest x-ray of respiratory distress syndrome or, or, you know, hyaline membrane disease. Notice the low lung volumes and the, you know, diffuse granular hazy opacities through the lungs because they're premature. They're at increased risk for intraventricular hemorrhage or necrotizing enterocolitis. The answer here is going to be B, intraventricular hemorrhage. Hope this was helpful. Please subscribe. Please like this. Please share this with everyone. Let's make sure everyone places in the 99th percentile on the USMLE. I know you all can do it. Thank you so much for your attention.